Hi, everyone. I'm smiling real big looking at all these people. So good evening. I am so glad that we're all here today. I'm Dr. Diana Lee. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training Initiatives at Columbia Zuckerman Institute. And I would like to welcome all of you to our Stavros Narcos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture tonight. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us again. This, this lecture was rescheduled, but you know what? It is gonna be so worth your wait because we have a really, really fantastic event lined up for you tonight. And we are here to continue our commitment to outstanding science and excellent programming. So the Stavros Narcos Foundation um, Brain Insight Lecture Series offers lectures featuring world-class scientists and experts addressing issues of societal importance to inform and engage our community. In conjunction with this lecture series, the Stavros Narcos Foundation Teacher Scholar Program supports our local science teachers who bring this content into their classrooms. And we are very happy to continue welcoming our teacher scholars back in person to this lecture series. And we're even more pleased to see so many of you tuning in online tonight. So we hope our presentation tonight will not only leave you with a better understanding of the science happening in New York City, at the Zuckerman Institute, at Columbia University, and in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, but also showcase real life applications of research and technology. And I'm especially thrilled about tonight's topic on what I like to call nature and nurture, as opposed to nature versus nurture, where our experts will explore how genes and experiences both can shape the brain across generations. I would also like to thank the Stavros Narcos Foundation and the foundation members who join us here tonight for their continued partnership and commitment to helping us make brain science accessible to all. So tonight, you'll be treated to presentations from two incredible speakers, followed by a conversation led by Columbia University's Dr. Paige Greenwood. Dr. Greenwood is a neuroscientist and postdoctoral research fellow at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She received her PhD in neuroscience from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine in 2021 and was awarded a T32 postdoctoral fellowship for translational research in child psychiatric disorders. Her research focuses on the joint effects of socioeconomic disadvantage and prenatal exposure to air pollution on the brain and childhood academic outcomes using functional MRI techniques in the Environment, Brain, and Behavior Lab led by Dr. Amy Margulis. She aims to use her research to develop targeted interventions to improve the outcomes for disadvantaged children and to advocate on behalf of health and educational equity. In addition to her research, Dr. Greenwood is a co-founder and professional development co-chair of the nonprofit Black in Neuro and an early career policy ambassador for the Society for Neuroscience. Before I turn it over to Dr. Greenwood to introduce tonight's incredible speakers, I want to thank those of you who already submitted questions in advance to our event. And what makes our lectures dynamic and engaging is when we're able to address the questions you have. So during our Q&A tonight, Dr. Greenwood will alternate between questions from our online audiences and in-person attendees. So if you're watching online, I definitely encourage you to use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions as you listen to tonight's talks. And for our in-person attendees, when it comes time, please raise your hand during that Q&A portion of our event to ask your question by speaking into this microphone. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our host and moderator of tonight's event, Dr. Paige Greenwood. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here today. And thank you, Diana, for that warm welcome. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's event. So we will he be hearing from Dr. Um, Bianca Jones Marlin and Dr. Yasmin Hurd, two experts who study the interplay between genes and our experiences and how they can impact not just our brains, but future generations. Taken together, but the complementary approaches of this topic, our speakers will discuss epigenetics, the fascinating the interplay between genes and the environment through the lenses of the brain development, learning, and addiction. 
I am very excited about today's talk as my own research is focused on identifying the compounding effects of prenatal exposure to air pollution and disadvantage on the brain and academic outcomes for marginalized youth. I'm particularly interested in how contingent experiences between parent and child in the environment can influence development longitudinally. Children living in impoverished environments are at increased risk for multiple exposures that can alter brain development and increase risk factors for psychiatric disorders and learning disabilities. Hence, it is imperative that we continue identifying the mechanism by which these exposures influence development for the betterment of future generations. It is also important for researchers and the public to come together to have these discussions about the research and potential, act on, um, potential actions to combat these growing disparities. In this event, we will hear two 15-minute talks, one from each speaker, after which I will moderate a discussion in which we will include questions from you, our audience. If you had already submitted a question, thank you so much. We look forward to going through them. If you wish to submit a question while the talks are in progress, please look for the Q&A button to submit your questions to the panelists. And please let us know if you're a teacher or a student. And if you're a student, tell us what grade you're in. We wanna know where you are. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bianca Jones-Marlin, who is a neuroscientist studying transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, the phenomenon in which biological responses to stressors can be passed down from parents to offspring. How is the brain altered by stress and how might those changes be beneficial or harmful for future generations? She is a Herbert and Florence Irving Assistant Professor of Cell Research at the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University in New York City. Her research investigates how organisms unlock innate behaviors at appropriate times and how learned information is passed to subsequent generations via transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Dr. Marlin combines neuroimaging, behavior, and molecular genetics to uncover how these learned behaviors in the parent can become innate behavior in the offspring. Work that promises to make a profound impact on societal brain health, mental well being, and parenting. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marlin to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paige, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining, joining with us today. And I'd like to take, have a special thanks to the Sarbos Nyarkos Foundation for having me here today. Uh, as Paige said, my name is Dr. Bianca Jones Marlin, and I'm a Herbert and Florence, Ir a Florence Irving Professor of Cell Research here at Columbia University. And the goal of my lab, the, the aim of my lab, is really to explore how the processes that underlie the important biological mechanisms of parental behavior emerge and are maintained over a lifetime. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how, how parents promote survival in their offspring. And canonically, this is siloed into one of two camps, nature, the innate or instinctual ability of a parent to pass their genes on to an offspring for survival or nurture, the learned components, what we teach our offspring. Um, and I want to take a special moment just to honor like the teachers that we have here uh, in the audience and, and, work, and zooming in. Um, I'm a former teacher, uh, seventh grade AP biology, uh, and <laughs> turned, turned neuroscientist. And a lot of the motivation of the work that we do now has to do with uh, the interactions I had with my students and what the lives at home and their lives in the classroom led to when it came to the standardization we have as teachers when it comes to testing and how to get kids to the next, the next level. So thank you all sincerely for what you do. I wouldn't be here without you guys. Canonically, we look at this between nature and nurture, and we commonly hear this being referred to as nature versus nurture. But uh, recent studies and my preliminary data begin to suggest that there is a gap that can be filled between nature and nurture. And specifically, things that we originally seen, were seen as genetic can actually be learned and then inherited in the next generation. So the goal of the Marlin Lab is to bridge the gap between nature and nurture. So I'm going to show you an example of uh, what, where this really spurred and where this was motivated from. These are some hard to see images, and these are images that were take, taken during the last winter of World War II. This is the Dutch hunger famine. And during this period of time, the Netherlands were cut off from food because they decided to protest the Nazi troops. 
and this man-made famine led to suffering in the land. And what they went to, on to note is that the children and the grandchildren of those who suffered during the Dutch hunger winter seem to suffer from metabolic issues, hypertension, diabetes, and even schizophrenia, which beg the question, how does an, an, an experience, a stressful experience, inform generations to come of what may be in the environment? In this case, a, a land of famine, even when there's when food is plenty. Researchers went on to explore this. And so here's an example I'm the, describing to you of a, a lab that explored, put animals on high protein or low fat diets and showed that their offspring suffered from metabolic issues as well. So we were able to replicate what we observed in history in mice, very um, commonly what we do when we take our, um, our data and our research to see how we can bring it back to society. And similarly, another lab explored how a stressful situation, in this case, a foot shock and an experience, the smell of odor, can change the brain. And I found this extremely interesting how a sensory cue, something that we may come across every day, paired with a stressful experience, could lead to changes, not just in the brain of a mammal, but for generations. So the topic I'm going to speak to you about today, one of the focuses of the Marlin Lab is this. How can an experience in a parent be inherited in naive offspring? A naive offspring meaning they've never experienced uh, the, the, the sense. In order to do that, we have a behavioral paradigm. So I wanna zoom you into the lab and what we do in the lab. We have mice and we present them with an odor and a very light foot shock. And in this paired paradigm, the animal has the odor and the foot shock at the same time. It begins to learn that every time I smell an odor, it predicts the foot shock. In the unpaired paradigm, we have an odor and then we have a foot shock separately. So these animals experience the stress of the foot shock and they experience the odor, the sense, but they never learn that the odor predicts the shock. We can explore this learning and observe this learning through this tri-chamber that we use. Where on top, the animals were paired with the purple odor. You see they don't enter the side that has a purple odor, whereas the animals on the bottom got the purple odor and got the shock, but they weren't at the same time. They don't create that connection. Given that learning took place behaviorally, we then zoom into the brain. So I'm showing you here a cross-section schematic of a mouse brain and the interesting neurons that we explore in the lab. So these dots that we see on top, these are main olfactory epithelium neurons, they're nose neurons. And what they do is they take an odor from the environment and they take that message from the environment into the brain. And what's really interesting, I think there's really cool, two cool things about the main olfactory epithelium I'll tell you about. So we'll geek out for a second. One, is that as a one is that they develop so there's a stem cell population and why this is cool is because in mammals there are very few parts of our brain that really turn over that new cells are, are shown to be born and one of them is the main olfactory bulb and the other is the hippocampus and even this has been um a area of controversy in the main olfactory epithelium these neurons are born so your neurons are born every about two weeks if you've um, ever headed a ball or uh, got into a, an accident or even had COVID, you may note that you lose your sense of smell for a period of time. And sometimes it's because these neurons have been sheared, but they can grow back. You wind up regaining your, 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 uh, your smell, sense of smell. And the other really cool thing about the main olfactory epithelium is as these baby neurons mature and become adult neurons, they can be anything that they wanna be when they grow up. They can be a mint sensing neuron or a flower sensing neuron, but as they grow up, they choose one receptor. They choose one odor that they respond to. So there's a beautiful level of specificity that we see in the nose. And this work uh, is, is, is actually um, shown by Columbia University's Richard Axel, my uh, mentor and colleague, and Linda Buck here at Columbia University in 2004, where they won the Nobel Prize for, for de describing this one receptor, one neuron um, uh, showing. And so I'm going to show you exactly what we do with this tissue in the main olfactory epithelium here. I'm gonna play a video and we've been able to take the main olfactory epithelium, this tissue from the nose, and we clear it with a process and we can look at it on a microscope. And the cells in the nose actually respond to chemicals in the air. The structure of the cells are still there, they're still present, but we can see through the bone and we can see through the fats and we can look at just the cells. From there, we put this tissue on something called a light sheet microscope. We're able to look at the whole tissue and we're able to have a 3D rendering of the nose and a beautiful image of the actual cells in the nose. Everything that's in green here 
are cells that respond to almond. These are the first cells that say, oh, I smell something, and it sends that message to the brain. And I should say, before I just put a video of myself on the screen, uh, that Science Friday um, did a, a science communication um, uh, interview with the lab and the, in their ability to approach, to bridge what we do in the lab with what, how we can um, educate society. So I'm very impressed with the work that they did there. So as I stated, we're able to take the tissue, clear it, and just look at the neurons in the nose that express the receptors of the odor we presented. And I'll show you an example of that here, where on the left side, your left side, we have a paired odor, paired odor nose, and on the right side, we have the unpaired odor nose. And each one of these dots is a neuron that responds to the odor. We're able to count these neurons to see if an odor paired with a stressful situation changes this really important part of the brain. I'm going to show you here a bar graph. And on the y-axis, which is this part here, it's the number of neurons that we had, the number of white dots that we were able to show. Naive are animals that hung out in their cage the entire time and have never experienced the odor or the shock. They're a control group. We have the unpaired. We talked about the unpaired. They have the odor and the shock, but they don't co-terminate. And then here we have the paired. In the paired, there are more neurons that express the receptor of the paired odor. The brain has changed in response to a stressful stimulus. Moreover, when we take these animals and we breed them, their children, shown here from the paired offspring and the unpaired offspring, their children are born with more neurons that express the receptor of the paired odor without ever experiencing the odor. A change has occurred in the brain in response to stress, and this has been observed in the offspring. So this phenomenon opens many questions as to how stressful experiences in mammals change the structure of the brain itself, and moreover, how it changes generations to come. Given this large study, we wanted to really zoom in on what could be happening. So we, at, we answered, can an experience in a parent be inherited in naive offspring? Yes, but how? And I talked to you about a cool part of the brain that um, has these neurons that can be born. I'm showing you here a video where on this side, we can label the birth date of cells. This is a brain that I've extracted and cleared, and I've labeled the birth date of cells. These cells are born here, and they're about one to three days old. I can track where they go over time using what we call EDU. It's a way of standing and marking the birth date of cells. We can track them over time and see where they go as they develop and move on to where they're going to be when they uh, live when they get older. I'm showing you an example of that here, where this is a slice of a mouse manal factor epithelium, mouse nose tissue. And what's in green are neurons that express the odor that I paired with. And red means that they were born during that time. And I'm going to show you a bar graph, counting the number of neurons that respond to an odor that were born. And the goal of this is to see are neurons that are being born getting a message that says, maybe I should be the receptor of the paired odor, even though I was planning on being something else when I grow up? And that's exactly what we see here. Whereas in naive and unpaired, we see similar numbers. However, in the paired situation, more neurons from that stem cell population that were planning on being a different receptor when they grow up are choosing the receptor of the paired odor. Seemingly, it seems that a, a message from the mature cells are telling the immature cells, this is important. You need to be like me when you grow up. You need to have the receptor of this paired odor. And so future questions in the lab are asking, is this what happens when a message goes from the nose to the next generation? Is there a message from the parent saying, this is going to be important for your survival, for you to thrive in this world, and therefore I'm going to give you this in inheritance so you can pass this on to future generations? And so in the last few minutes, of my uh, talk here, we showed you that an odor experience in a parent can be inherited in naive offspring. We wanted to ask, can other senses do this as well? And so this work was motivated by this uh, amazing student right here, Emily Sherman. You may ask, why are we standing outside partying? This is the JetBlue terminal at JFK. Uh, and Will, Will Foster, who was not invited to the party, also did this work. <laughs> he wasn't there at the time. Uh, so what were we doing at JFK? Uh, Emily tweeted, I want to have my 21st birthday party at the JetBlue terminal at JFK. And JetBlue responded, 
happy, happy upcoming birthday. So it was an amazing party. Um, and I'm so impressed that she was able to both get JetBlue to throw her 21st birthday party and also think up this experiment. And this experiment came when we were coming, she was walking to and from lab and she walked past Chipotle and she's like, Bianca, just walked past Chipotle and I felt horrible. I got sick from there and I hope my children don't hate Chipotle and looked at me. And the motivated this study, we call it the Chipotle study. And what we do here is we have something that is innately appetitive. In this case, sweet tasting, saccharin, and we give it to an animal for 10 minutes. We then inject it with something that makes them nauseous called lithium chloride. And then we give them the option between water, which is usually not preferred over sweet, and sweet. And this is called classic taste aversion. There's, there, it's, it's been shown before in the past. And I'm gonna show you a video here where an animal um, will taste sweet and enjoy it. However, when it gets lithium chloride injection, it will taste the sweet tastant and not enjoy it as much. We then wanted to make a, an aversion index to see how much animal like, animals like this and then take the parents, specifically the dads, and then breed them to see if their offspring would respond. I'm showing you here a, a graph in which everything above this line means the animals like it, it's appetitive, and everything below the line is aversive. And the animals that were injected with lithium chloride, you see after sweet, they don't like sweet. This has been shown before, this is classical taste conditioning. This, however, was astounding. It was really astounding. So astounding, I cannot show you. Uh, there's no mouse here, so should I? Yeah, oh, there we go. What we, what we observed is that the offspring, who have never experienced in this case the sweet taste then, are avoiding an innately appetitive cue. They're avoiding sugar, which is essential for their survival. So future work in collaboration with, um, with uh, with scientists at like Caltech are going to explore not just how this is happening molecularly, but also observing how the response to the facial response to um, sweet tasting over at generations to see if we can have both a behavioral and an avoidant, avoidance outcome, outcome. And with that, uh, I showed you about exciting work that's happening in the lab. Um, but the work really is, has been motivated by these two people. So these are my parents. Uh, and you could tell probably by all the alcohol in the bathroom, it's my first birthday or something of the sort. <laughs> um, but my parents are my biological parents, uh, and they were also foster parents. So I had the amazing and dynamic opportunity to grow up in a very intriguing um, home in which I found out why my foster, foster siblings wound up living with me. Um, and in retrospect, their stories really motivated the work that we do. And I'm proud that we can take experiences, put science to it, and really explore what it means to give information to an ancestor, from an ancestor to an offspring, how to optimize that when it works well and how to change it when it doesn't. So I'm very thankful for that. And with that, I thank the Marlin Lab for the beautiful work they do, much of which is shown today. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Marlin, um, for that incredible talk. Remember, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A button. And we will try to answer them in the Q&A button after the second talk. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Yasmin Hurd, who is a neuroscientist studying the effects of drug exposure, in particular cannabis, during crucial, crucial periods of brain development, such as the prenatal and adolescent years and the impact of environmental stress. But could drug exposure before pregnancy even begins influence the next generation? Dr. Yasmin Hurd is the director of the Addiction Institute within the Mount Sinai Behavioral System, as well as the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Dr. Hurd is an internationally renowned neuroscientist whose translational research examines the neurobiology of drug abuse and related psychiatric disorders. Her research exploring the neurobiological effects of cannabis and heroin has significantly shaped the field today. Using multidisciplinary research approaches, her research has provided unique insights into the impact of developmental cannabis exposure and epigenetic mechanisms 
underlying the drug's protracted effects into adulthood and even across generations. The impact of Dr. Hurd's research has attracted both academic and popular attention, including articles and interviews in the Time Magazine and the New York Times. She has also received a number of awards and honors, including the Sarah Gund Prize, Child Mind Institute Distinguished Scholar Award, and the Mika Sal Peter Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Neuroscience. In addition, based on her high scientific impact and accomplishments, Dr. Hurd was inducted into both the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hurd to the stage. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to this uh, really interesting forum and for Dr. Marlin for setting a really high uh, bar. I, I think that for me, you know, you'll see some of the research that we've done and obviously um, Dr. Marlin has, you know, given really good insights about how the experience of, of each of the things that we, 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 we have in our lives every day that you think it's just normal, how it can have such a huge impact across the generations. So yes, what happens in one generation does not stay there. It does transmit. And these epigenetic mechanisms have been really fascinating for me for a very long time, before I even understood what was epigenetics. And I think that's something that I'm sure some people in the audience, I'm not a teacher and well trained in that context. So I hope some of the things we'll talk about um, I won't get too granular, but one thing I do want to emphasize is that throughout our, and I realize that I can't really, well, I can point, but the audience in line won't see, but throughout our lives, we are exposed to so many things that impacts on our epigenetic mechanisms, not just from, but yes, during fertilization and then early stages in our development, those are when, I mean, really large fundamental epigenetic um, explosions, you can say, occur. But it occurs throughout our lives, throughout infancy, childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. And for me, this is the issue that it's dynamic. You have these epigenetic mechanisms on our DNA that are open and closed, depending on the experiences that, that you have during your life. I'm focusing a lot today on the endocannabinoid system because I'm going to tell you about cannabis and that experience. But cannabis is just one of many experiences. It's really how does this impact on us as individuals and as we said, across generations. The endocannabinoid system is really critical. It's a fundamental biological system that has a number of enzymes that make our endogenous ligands, the receptors where cannabis in terms of THC, the psychoactive component that leads to the high and so on, binds in, our, in, in this endocannabinoid system. For development, and especially neurodevelopment, because I'm biased, I think everything is about the brain, um, the endocannabinoid system is even more important because it is dynamic throughout every single from the the sperm, and the sperm means the egg, every single facet of development, the endocannabinoid system plays a critical role. And for us, when we think about it, we think about the, I'm going to talk mainly about, uh, well, both uh, different stages of development, prenatal and some adolescence. But when we think about prenatal, as Dr. Marlin just showed you, the pregnant woman, well, first, the the birds and the bees, the eggs meet the, the sperm. Um, but the F1 generation, we call it, the fetus, the baby that's exposed to whatever she's exposed to. And the endocannabinoid system in her, in her, in her fetus plays a really critical role for even the hard wiring of the brain. So that's actually how I really started being interested in the endocannabinoid system during development. Because if this system, and a lot of our work and colleagues contributed to understanding that if this system plays such a critical role of how the brain develops, can exposure to cannabis during this time make any impact? 
So one of the things that we've done, we have looked in both humans and animal models here, we'll show you what we looked at in the human fetal brain, whose mothers were um, used cannabis. And what we could see is that there are some fundamental things that, yes, we replicated what we thought or, and people had seen in animals, for example, genes and proteins related to the cytoskeletal function, so the hard wiring of the brain, those fetuses whose mother smoked cannabis, we could see that this, these cytoskeletal genes and that organization was different in the brain and in multiple brain regions. We could also see that it impacted on other endo and endogenous systems that are very critical for just um, fundamental. Here, this is an opioid peptide system, plays a role in, in reward, motivation, pain, stress response. Also, the amount of cannabis the moms used, you could see that it, it associated with the, the expression of these genes in the human fetal brain. We could also see that classic transmitter systems, I, neuropsychiatric disorders, psychiatric and addictive addiction disorders, dopamine is very critical for that. And dopamine is a transmitter, as many people know, reward, goal-directed behaviors, learning, attention. And we could see, once again, that in particular brain regions of the fetuses whose mom smoked cannabis, we could see this perturbation of dopaminergic systems in the brain. We could also see that these dopaminergic systems and, and others as well even showed a sex difference, which was very shocking because often we, when we study um, cannabis and a lot of times people were like, in, you know, young adults and we study them, they're like, it's always the boys, always the young men. And we thought, oh, it's societal, but here, these are fetuses. These are mid-gestational fetuses, and you could see that there was a sex difference already. But because our human studies are very complex, many of the women used other drugs, and they, even if we controlled for it in our control subjects, still the question is, how specific is it to cannabis? And a big question for me is, like, does it really have an impact? Does it last into adulthood? And so that's where animal models come in. I'm not going to show you all of the results that we've gotten, but we could actually replicate things that we saw in the human fetus that have been exposed to cannabis if we exposed our rat model, our pregnant mom, to THC. And we could see, for example, the cytoskeletal changes, the dopamine changes, and importantly, these lasted into adulthood. So it wasn't just at that prenatal stage. But Again, being a masochist that I am, I met um, someone who's even more masochistic than I am, Yoko Nomura, who actually trained at Columbia. And we wanted to see does what happens in humans. So we're studying our animals into adulthood. Can we start looking at humans across their lifespan? And we have been studying, um, Yoko was studying stress during pregnancy. And so we said, um, and I was a mentor for that and said, let's also look and see if drug exposure in particular cannabis. And so something though happened where, you know, most pregnant women, who oh, I shouldn't be moving, sorry, and my hands too, <laughs> have very similar, um, many pregnant women will have different types of stressors. So it was very, you know, messy, but one very prominent stress for all of us here in New York about 10 years ago was the Hurricane Sandy. And we had been studying women before Sandy, during Sunday, and after. And we've been studying their kids for many years. The kids come in every year. They get um, psychology, sociologists, um, counselors, and we go through a lot of different things to see what had happened in terms of stress. But for me, the question was, could we gain any insights about what the environment these kids had had while um, in, in utero? And one of the things that we decided to do was to study the placenta. And we call the placenta jokingly, quote unquote, the third brain. It is one of the most critical temporary organs, obviously, but it is that link between the mom and the baby. And what we could do was to sequence it. And when we sequence the placenta, we could see that changes in the endocannabinoid system here, the cannabinoid receptor, did correlate to what the moms said they had used. But what was shocking when we looked in an unbiased manner was what is really changed in the placenta? And it was in systems related to immune function. No matter how we looked at the, the placenta, we could see this. So does it really matter what happens to the children in terms of their behavior? 
and I'm summarizing a lot of data. This is just an early stage in terms of when they were about four years old. Even at six months, you could start to see things that were different. And one of the things that was very prominent, anxiety. There was a really strong anxiety differences, um, aggression and hyperactivity. But we could even see when we measured their stress hormones in their hair, that even physiological things like their cortisol level differed. And the thing that was fascinating was that the placental transcriptome, the gene expression in the placenta, predicted their kids' behavior, particularly when it came to anxiety. But it's not so simple. We have many experiences and coming back to stress. Stress and cannabis actually had this huge synergistic effect. And I'm not going to talk as much about it. We can talk about it in QA. But the combination of stress and cannabis increase anxiety and aggression dramatically in the kids and even in the, the onset of their, their um, diagnostic, um, the year of the first onset of the behavioral um, symptoms that we saw in the kids. So we know in the, from our human studies that um, you can see things that occur during prenatal environmental exposures very early. So now in our animal models, we're able to now, we had always studied, I should say, we'd always, in our animal models, we'd always studied them um, as adults, those that had gotten prenatal exposure to cannabis. But based on what we saw in the humans, we said, okay, let's start studying much earlier. And we can see things from infancy, um, yes, during adolescence, where there are changes in affective behavior, stress response, and in adulthood, yes, changes in motivation, depression-like symptoms, stress sensitivity is huge, and also opioid sensitivity, and I'll come back to that. But one of the things that our animal model also showed us, we could study the placenta, and we could replicate what we saw in the human placenta, that there was this huge dysregulation of the immune system, which is shown in yellow. And again, we see the sex difference here where the boys are more affected. So one of the things that my group um, that we try to study is you know what are the underlying epigenetic mechanisms that are maintaining these um, behaviors things over time and so i'm gonna go fast because it's not this kind of audience to give you like the detail but the epigenetic mechanisms we can see there are many different types of epigenetic tags on our dna in terms of what keeps our dna open so genes can um, be turned on or closes it so genes are turned off and we could identify one particular epigenetic uh, mark. And that epigenetic mark, when we looked exactly where it's being, um, it's targeting in the DNA, it was targeting, again, a lot of these immune related genes. And now this is in the brain of the adults. So that this immune perturbation that we could um, see from early on in their lives was then manifested even in the brain and it reorganized this. But we could also see these epigenetic marks and this particular tag, even in the placenta. And again, sex difference. So when we think about epigenetics today, as molecular biologists, we talk about, like I said, these specific epigenetic marks and so on. But the initial de definition of epigenetics brought me down this path about <laughs> transgenerational effects, because Conrad Wyington very early in the 1940s, in terms of the environmental impact, he said that in order for something to be called epigenetic, it had to be assimilated into the genome and inherited. And that's what brought us down this crazy path about the intra-transgenerational effects. My team hates me at that time because it was already challenging just to look at prenatal effects into adulthood, but this is what we have. So the question is, can germline um, uh, exposure to cannabis really make an impact. So we, the F0 generation that, that are exposed initially to it, we can replicate that in our animal models here. We even have young, um, young rats fall in love. Well, no, they first get cannabis, never see cannabis again. <laughs> then they fall in love as adults. So just, I don't want to let. And then we look at their offspring and somebody else raises their offspring just in case they may not be the best mother or father. And we could see that we could replicate, and I'm, you'll tell you why I looked at heroin later, but, um, well, I should say now, I study addiction vulnerability, and this is what, you know, in terms of does early life experience change the brain to make you more sensitive to addiction? And we could see that, indeed, 
animals that had prenatal exposure to THC self-administered more heroin, but so too was the F1 generation, um, or the, sorry, the parents, and so too with the F1 generation and changes in their brains in terms of functional activity. We could identify specific epigenetic marks, specifically in terms of how the neurons spoke in terms of synaptic plasticity. Once again, we see this same epigenetic tag in their brain. And when we start to really look at the, the transgenerational effects, if you're looking at um, the, the, the offspring of the mother and during prenatal, obviously the, the fetus gets direct exposure, but actually that mom also carries the germ cells of her grandkids. So they can also get exposed. So that F2 generation, you have to actually go to F3 before you can say something really was, um, had a transgenerational um, effect or intragenerational effect. So in looking at the F3 generation, their great grandkids, we could see that also their behavior differs. They've never seen THC, never seen cannabis. And once again, well, no, now I turned into a sperm doctor because we had to figure out why, I'm not gonna tell you, but we could then identify these epigenetic tags in the sperm as it matured and impacted the inheritance of this. So definitely it's not just the parent, their direct offspring, but their great grandkids that impact on brain and that these epigenetic marks are really critical. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Hurd, for that incredible talk. So now we'll invite Dr. Marlin up for a quick discussion and some Q&A. So both of you all's talks were so beautiful and complemented each other so well. And it really hi highlighted the impact that genetics and experiences can have on our development and generations to come. When considering risk factors for psychiatric disorders and deficits with learning and memory, our first line of thought is to consider our parents. However, various forms of trauma can be passed down through genetics generationally, as you guys said, and it can affect brain and behavior, which begs the question of how horrific events in our history ha that have harmed people of color, as well as those at various intersections, have resulted in maladaptive or adaptive epigenetic, epigenetic traits. How do we use this research to identify key changes with brain and behavior, whether good or bad, so that we can translate it into a um, societal um, health impact? Go with this first? I'm gonna start <laughs> off. When we think of the word, it's an excellent question, uh, Dr. Newman, so thank you. When we think of the word maladaptive, mm -hmm. we really need to sit with the word maladaptive because it can come with uh, shame mm -hmm. for something that we can't control with our, which are our genetics and our epigenetics as an individual. Mm -hmm. But biology is smart. And one pillar that the Marlon Lab stands for is biology wants us to survive. Yeah. So if it's maladaptive, how is it that biology would put something in front of us that's going to take us out as mm -hmm. opposed to maintain us? Mm -hmm. When we think about, uh, for example, I, I discussed like diabetes, hypertension, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. These could be seen as adaptive if there's no food around. Mm -hmm. but the environment changes and the body may not have may not have been able to catch up to that change mm -hmm. and so what needs to change maybe the healthcare system mm -hmm. needs to be aware that certain populations certain people groups and mm -hmm. particularly you talked about black and brown populations yeah. have been starved for generations mm -hmm. hundreds of years mm -hmm. so if there's a disease that seems to be more prominent what is the current food situation mm -hmm. is it hyperchloric and then what is the genetic and epigenetic memory of that mm -hmm. constant starvation? Mm -hmm. And could those two be a mix for what we see? Yeah. Those are the questions that those in the healthcare system really would focus on and really mm -hmm. addressing maladaptive. Absolutely. Completely agree. I mean, we survive, we're here because we're survivors. Um, and the question is absolutely the environment that you're born into that obviously your great grandparents had no clue that you were going to make. And so for me, mm -hmm. epigenetics is a fascinating mechanism because it's, I think about it as how do you tell your grandkids to that this thing is going to happen? 
to change the genetic code takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. So that's how epigenetics is able to transmit certain things from the, the Dutch famine, even the Holocaust, mm -hmm. slavery. But what happens is that, as, as Dr. Marlin said, the grandkids, the great grandkids, the great, great, great grandkids, the environment was a little different. Mm -hmm. And so by the time your the biology is able to catch up, another generation and society changes. Mm -hmm. Today, I mean, we have a lot of things in our environment. I mean, coming back to your work, pollution, mm -hmm. that we know absolutely has changed both the DNA sequence mm -hmm. and epigenetics. What's going to happen to the great grandkids from that? we know that it's going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. So how do we as a healthcare system try to inform the next generation while improving health for the people today? And that is the big question. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, <clears throat> excuse me. I often think about how um, those differences and how they've been passed down to generation to generation impact myself, but also my own brother. And in your all studies, you guys talk about sex differences um, mm -hmm. that you all saw due to, to the mice aversions or due to cannabis use. And so what I'm curious about is, are there sex differences when we're examining these traumatic experiences that um, are happening um, in utero? And what, how do they manifest when we're looking at those sex differences? As I saw, showed you, I mean, it's not just only the there are definitely sex differences, not for everything. Mm -hmm. I showed you, like, you know, I don't want people to go away thinking, oh, the boys are like yeah. this. Girls also can um, show other behavioral um, differences. Or coming back to this aspect of maladaptive, there are a lot of behaviors mm -hmm. actually that can help them. Why is it that the boys may be, um, show greater awareness? That may be certain things that help them for, you know, well, we can go on again about behavior. So the sex differences are there, but it's also what they experience in their life. Mm -hmm. So I'm also going to say that I was biased because as mentioned, like in our human work, everybody always says, oh, the boys are this because boys mm -hmm. will be boys and the hyperactivity and all of those things. Yeah. And so society treats the boys a little different. Yeah. So you have the initial, from prenatal, absolutely, we don't know why, but definitely male offspring are more vulnerable during um, uh, fetal um, development mm -hmm. than girls. But then they have an extra burden during our in society. So mm -hmm. I think that we can't completely separate the sex differences that yes, our by our experimental animal models help mm -hmm. us. But it's very complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Anything you would like to comment? Yeah, that's on that? Beautifully covered. Awesome. So um, another question that I have is in regards to cannabis use and how it's really common right now for pregnant women to use cannabis, maybe for nausea or um, to help ease the pregnancy. Um, and with that being said, we have this wonderful question from a 12th grader about how cannabis engagement <clears throat> from pregnant women can impact the genetic development of the offspring. So how does that manifest or how can that take place? So um, thank you very much for the question. And unfortunately, I think our society today is um, being very unfair to women and kids and saying that, you know, cannabis is, you know, this benign drug and so on. On the endocan our endogenous cannabinoid system, as I showed, is really critical for our brain development, actually our whole body development, but our brain development. So if you have especially high potency cannabis, which is what is out there today, um, the cannabis today is not the cannabis that was uh, originally on this planet. The cannabis on the planet, um, it was like two to 4% THC. Today we have 24% um, and even up to 80% THC that's being consumed. So it's overwhelming our endogenous cannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that's why we're seeing more health related things with developmental effects of cannabis today than we've ever seen before it's just <laughs> a complete different world yeah absolutely and i have a question for dr marlin from yes. a third year undergraduate student from the university of minnesota twin mm -hmm. cities oh. so what they're curious about is how long 
can the stress or those stress changes last within future generations? It's a very important question. If this stress is being induced over the span in the lab of three days, uh, and we see it in the next generation, how flexible mm -hmm. is this? We've observed it only for the first generation currently in our hands. Mm -hmm. But of course, we've, we've, we've seen demonstrated today and in many other model, mo other model organisms that this can last throughout time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the second question to think about. We're looking at mice and we use mice as a proxy to humans given they're, they're both mammals, mm -hmm. but also we look at mice because mice within, within themselves are interesting. Behavior is interesting and this is a really important bridge mm -hmm. that we need to start uh, building yeah. in order to get to humans. So in worms, we can see this up to the ninth generation. Mm -hmm. You pair a worm with something that they don't like, mm -hmm. nine generations later, they will avoid it. Wow. Whereas in mammals, we've seen it in one. So we know that there are going to be difference when it comes to these mammals and these humans. Mm -hmm. And so I think it goes really into the specific question. What is it that we're looking for? Mm -hmm. And what is the thing? Yeah. Right? What, what is the thing that is passed down? Yeah. We're looking at changes in the nose. What's happening in the brain? Mm -hmm. What's happening in the fear centers? So when we find that thing, I think we'll have more, more insight into that answer. Beautiful. I definitely want to open up the questions for our audience. So if there's anybody who would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand and we'll get to you. We have a question right okay. there. Good evening. Um, so my question is, I know that you said you've only observed the changes in one generation due to stress. And you've said that you've observed that the body just takes a long time to catch up to its environment. Do you think that with the increased cannabis use and the, the level of THC in the cannabis, that, you're, that the bodies will adapt then to mm. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whoever said great question was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one thing about us that we're all here, it's about evolution. Mm. We do adapt. It depends on how many generations it takes to adapt to our environment. I love your giraffe for your, your, yeah. your lab. Um, the giraffe didn't start off that way with a long net. So there will be evolution. Um, how long? I don't know. The one thing I do know is that we are, because we're seeing greater health risks and especially mm -hmm. more psychiatric risks, this is something that we do need to address. Um, so, and we talked about the, you know, the fact that the healthcare system is really overwhelmed right now, and it's not great for a certain communities who don't get access to um, great healthcare. And it's not just healthcare. So let's take it back to the teachers. Um, in terms of the educational system, is really poor in many places, and. If you don't have an education system that's taking all of this into consideration and changing how we're teaching, then to me that will be a problem. So at Sinai, for example, we have a community, pro well, we, we, we have two programs. One in where we have high school for kids with co-occurring disorders, mm -hmm. being substance use with psychiatric disorders as well, where they finish high school with us, mm -hmm. that we've now expanded into the community and actually working with um, schools where these kids have huge trauma. So I'm gonna say, I remember cannabis is, you know, the potency, the high potency THC is what we see has the greatest effect with stress. And most of these kids have high trauma and then they're being, you know, pushed with all of these high dose THC and that's the issue. So we need to meet the kids where they are Mm -hmm. And that is in the schools. And we can't expect mm -hmm. the teachers to be a, a psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker. And so that's why we're mm -hmm. partnered with them. Because can we, if we can treat early, can we change the trajectory um, over time? Mm -hmm. Any other audience questions? Um, we have one right here. Oh, yes. Hi, thank you uh, both for the, for the presentations. Um, so a lot of the examples that we saw, like the Dutch hunger famine or a shock to the foot, are um, sort of building aversions. Do we see it go the other way too, where if like an odor is paired with a reward, mm -hmm. is the sort of then propensity to seek that also inherited? It's a great question. Is reward also going to create changes in the brain? And given that 
let's take mammals for example, really all model organisms will go towards what they find appetitive, they like, and go away from what they find aversive. It could be that this at one point in time in evolution was like, oh, I like this, let me try it again. And that change has persisted over time. So to build upon an already very strong network for aversion, one could, uh, for appetitiveness, one could do. I have to say, uh, and it, it may not be like the most exciting, um, like happy answer, but if it works, if they found something that works and it makes their brains better and happier and happiness leads to healthier brains, great. I don't need to focus on studying that. Okay? <laughs> I want to dig, dig apart what, where, where there are wrongs that are happening or things that are, as we say, maybe maladaptive and how that, that uh, works in society. So mm -hmm. I haven't put the energy in to dig through that yet. <laughs> yeah, there are a few groups looking at love and things like that. We'll see how it works <laughs> out. Yeah, and stuff for the great to get grants to fund all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other audience questions? We have one right up here. Oh, wait. Oh. Hi. <laughs> How does uh, overstimulation of the cannabinoid receptors affect uh, dopamine release over time? Um, great. So as I showed, like even in the fetuses, in the um, the dopamine system is altered in significantly. And the thing that I found interesting was that the dopaminergic system was altered in a way that we see in adults who have. Um, substance use disorder. So there's like a dopamine receptor, the dopamine D2 it's called. And when you image people who have substance use disorders, many of them show this characteristic change. And these were fetuses who, you know, obviously they got exposed, that they show the same pattern even so early. So we see this, um, again, whether adaptive or maladaptive change to dopamine, um, that the, dop the dopamine levels aren't elevated all the time. It depends on where you are following the drug use. And that's what people need to realize as well. And that's what makes developing treatments a little challenging. Our neurotransmitter systems are very dynamic. So when we're craving, they're in one state. When we are, quote unquote, you know, taking a drug or, or high, or actually, I shouldn't say, you know, they change constantly. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to develop um, behavioral changes that help you to, like the feedback. Mm -hmm. Feedback, and that's one of the things, again, the earlier you interact with children who may be exposed to many different um, negative things in society, they can control their brain. We're giving a lot of, we obviously as a neuroscientist, I'm trying to figure out where, you know, that I can try and develop some pharmacological agent. But one of the things that's also critical for people to understand is that we actually have much more power over our brain, but we just don't teach children that. And so once we can do that on a more consistent level, when you're feeling this thing, you can have feedback. Yes, you can have certain things that can help you along the way, but that's what we're hoping for. That's where we're going. So I wanna shift gears really quickly to talk about compounding exposures. So like within my own research, um, we focus on black and Latinx populations because they are in environments that are relatively saturated with air pollution, but then you also have those social stressors. So if the historical exposures that cause the brain changes persist across generations, do we see compounding um, or do you guys see compounding in your work? or an exacerbation of the differences in the brain compared to completely naive? I have a, a quick response for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what's not going to directly correlate to um, a, a human populations, okay. but we're a firm believer yeah. that what we do in our mice, what we observe in our mice has the ability to, to bridge those gaps. We are, uh, part of the lab is really interested in how pregnancy mm -hmm becomes a sensitive period. Mm -hmm. So you present an odor, foot shock, a stressful situation in foot shock, in a male, we breed and look at the next generation. In a, we call them virgin females. We don't ask them what their priors were. We just call them <laughs> naive virgins mm -hmm. um, and shock and train them. And then pregnancy around the peripartum period. Does that change the way that the animal will respond to a stress? Mm -hmm. This is part of the lab and what we're looking at now because stress is, uh, pregnancy is seen as a stressor. Mm -hmm. We also yeah. see this emergence of resilience and non-resilient animal groups. Mm -hmm. So it's a question, yeah, we hope to answer very soon with how pregnancy can, can change this. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
again, the reason that we're on the level of the junior um, scientists, it's complex. Mm -hmm. And the com it's the compounding of so many variables. Mm -hmm. So as you said, pollution, huge. Pollution could, you know, huge impact on the brain. Mm -hmm. Stress, as I said, from our work, mm -hmm. the combination, the kids who show the greatest effects um, behaviorally from even six months that could see are those that had both prenatal exposure to extreme stress mm -hmm. and cannabis, mm -hmm. plus other things. Yeah. We also, I didn't, obviously not enough time show, it gets compounded even more with postnatal stress. So we already have these kids that have this, then the postnatal stress and then COVID, we see that the COVID, they actually also responded even worse. Mm -hmm. So put generational stress, stress on pregnant moms, mm -hmm. especially in those communities who don't get as much um, health care and support mm -hmm. during one of the research, um, um, the support that the, the families, the mom and the families mm -hmm. have makes a huge impact on their kids' yeah. outcome. So generational, the pregnancy, postnatal, mm -hmm. all of these things, it's compounding. And then we're trying to figure out these one, two places in the brain and so on that it impacts, but it's a, such a complex um, mm -hmm. thing. So it's going to take a while. I'm optimistic as well that, mm -hmm. you know, we're figuring things out, but it's a very complex combination of all of those mm -hmm. things. I'd like to make a comment. Yeah. Because I realize in, in sitting here and listening to our talk, um, our talks, both Dr. Yurt and I, or Dr. Hurd and I, we look at what the problem is. We're scientists. We look for problems and try to create a solution. Mm -hmm. But we're biologists first. Yeah. And I just want to make sure this is said out loud to people who are listening, people who are in the room hear this. Biology adapts. Because your parent used cannabis or your parents were stressed when you were pregnant or your parents you didn't know, it does not mean that you are now on a, a train exactly. to destruction. Exactly. We adapt to our environments continually. These little mites adapt to a light foot shock in their very long, short life. <laughs> but we also can adapt to the things that are repetitive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one thing you said, Dr. Hurd, was that support seems to ha create change outcomes. It does. It's incredible. One yeah. aspect of the lab that we study is mm -hmm. oxytocin. It's, it's familial. It creates, um, it creates bonds between, between people. Society has the ability, and I believe this firmly, society has the ability to move these shifts. Yeah to change this train that could be going towards destruction and move it towards a place, a safe place. Mm -hmm. Make sure that's, okay. that, that's, that's heard. Yeah. I think that's so beautiful. Um, I definitely think when science meets society, we can really create some sustainable change. Um, we have this really nice question from another 12th grader who completed a final project recently mm -hmm. um, where they aim to study adolescent exposure to THC and if it can cause impact cross-generationally on dendritic spine morphology in mice. So, I've been looking for a job. Dr. Hurd, <laughs> I know, yeah. So, yeah, me. Yeah, do you think the spines are affected? Unfortunately, I have to tell you that the study has been done mm -hmm. um, and spines are affected, so you should definitely look at it. Yeah. Um, there are many different aspects of spine, however, so there's a lot that for you to do. But we do see that adolescent THC exposure. But I'm going to come back to this aspect of just like humans, not all our rats that um, are given THC uh, respond to having increased say, addiction um, risk mm -hmm. or depression like behavior. They're animals that actually um, completely normal. And we didn't give them any social uh, attention. You know, probably the other rats in the cage might have been nicer to them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But so it's important to, it, it's just tougher to study for us. Um, at one point, I tried to, to, to take out those animals, not take out, but to study those animals who actually were completely fine. It's just we don't have enough space mm -hmm. and, and it's very challenging. But they're very fascinating because when we saw some preliminary results, they didn't show the same spine changes. So um, it's interesting. So hopefully um, you'll get that project going. Mm -hmm. Best of luck out there. Yeah. Um, I want to open up um, the questions to the audience again. If anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we have one um, right behind and then one up here. Um, I was just wondering how you came to focus on cannab cannabinoids specifically. Like, why not 
the long list of other things are out there. Why not <laughs> even like, let's say alcohol, right? Because that use is way more prevalent, I'd say, than THC use. Like, why specifically THC? That's a great question of my personal life. So my friends will tell you that when I decided to become an addiction scientist, they said that's ridiculous because you've never. Um, so in college, it was the first time I even drank alcohol. <laughs> uh, they're like, I'm Jamaican. I was born in Jamaica. And they're like, you didn't even smoke marijuana. So they're like, how can you become an addiction scientist? And, you know, some of our patients have said, you need to learn more about this. And I tell, <laughs> they tell me. Um, so it was alcohol actually has been studied very much for development. We know alcohol, you know, the fetal alcohol syndrome. I studied cannabis going backwards. We were studying adults with opioid and cocaine use, and we're looking at what are risk factors for adult use. Genetics was one, and we studied genetics, but invariably people will tell us about they started early with this, they started early with that. Cannabis, nicotine, and alcohol were the three things. There was very little work on cannabis at that time. In fact, I couldn't even get grants for studying because people said it's not, doesn't do anything for the brain. But I was just interested in, in that. And when I started understanding the fundamental role that our endogenous cannabinoid system plays, and I probably should have mentioned, the endocannabinoid system actually regulates the stress system. So what we're looking at with cannabis may, is actually, I think, uh, a, a stress response. And that's what we're looking at globally across generations. So it's not, so that's how I got into cannabis, to be honest. We'll take another question from the audience right here. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talks. Um, so Dr. Marling mentioned that we need to figure out what is the one thing that's happening in the brain. Um, but I, I was wondering, since the ch these changes can be so widespread, like using the THC and then seeing changes in other neurotransmitter systems, how would you determine this one thing? And what would you expect it to be? Wow, well, yes. <laughs> How do we determine what it is that responds to a stimulus, changes the brain, makes it through the gap of time, and into the next generation? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a few hypotheses. And one is this. Because we're looking at this beautiful part of the brain, the nose, the main olfactory epithelium, and we have these receptor-specific um, milieu that we, we spoke about, we can pretty much see what neuron is speaking to what receptor because we can color them with different colors. We can use genetic tools to say which one responds to, uh, to mint and then label that one particularly. And what we hypothesize is happening is that the mature cells are saying, I'm team purple odor and I'm going to send information to the stem cell population. And this information can be packaged in vesicles and they're called extracellular vesicles. And so the information that could be in there could be something along the lines of RNA, which comes mm. from DNA, which can give information from what that main cell is. Because if you don't know what you're going to be as a stem cell, you need something to lead you in that direction. And we're getting a really specific change. The specific change is just the neurons that, that respect, express that receptor, the ones that are getting older. So that a communication can go from like top of the nose to middle bottom of the nose. Maybe it can be maintained in the body. Maybe you can get to some part of the body, let's name the bloodstream, into the testes. In this case, we're looking at males, be maintained and pass to the next generation. So this is our current hunch. We're, 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 our hunch is that there's something that's packing up this information in a safe place, bringing it through the body to the next generation, where it's be, when it meets with egg, it's being able to be maintained and sit, and sit beautifully. So my final question to you all is to discuss science and society. So we know scientific research can help us address unknown questions for the betterment of our communities. However, amongst communities that are the most marginalized, there can be barriers to treatment, historical medical mistrust, or just mistrust of systems in general. How do we meet people where they are culturally mm -hmm. so we can use science for society? Um, it's a great question, huge question. We've covered a little bit um, previously. I think the major thing that, I don't know, I think that science and society are, are too separated. 
and especially in certain communities. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We need to change our whole education system. Sorry, teachers. Okay. I hope that you guys are part of that. I think that the way that science is taught is not realistic, the way many things are taught. And I think if we have kids engaged mm -hmm. in the science, helping us to develop the experiments, mm -hmm. to understand, they ask the questions. I think that that's one way we can actually bridge some of mm -hmm. this. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I think like everything else, we need to be more vocal. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't, um, we wait for bad things, really, really bad things to happen, and then we will um, walk the streets and so mm -hmm. on. Bad things are happening every second. Kids mm -hmm. in certain communities, they shouldn't go to sleep like the way they do or have the, the parenting and because their parents were traumatized, their grandparents were traumatized, and we just say, until it impacts us, it's not our problem. Mm -hmm. And I think until our society takes that, we're all in this together. Yeah. The human species, I will say, are there sex differences? Yes, we talked about. Are there racial differences? Yes. End of mm -hmm. the day, the differences are very minute. I will be really honest. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize that the human race will not survive yeah. if we do not all come together and figure out healthcare plans for everyone, use the science to, to inform how medicine should be done. And people can shoot me, but I do think that a universal healthcare system, mm -hmm. how we treat the, 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 the most disadvantaged people in our society is a reflection on us. And so that to me, every kid should have, there should be no starvation in the US. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, we didn't talk about food. Food makes a huge impact yeah. on the stress, on the this, on the drugs, on the that. Yeah. So I can go on for hours, but I know we have like one minute left, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Marlon. I'll make, I'll make my answer in one minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, guys, stop laughing. Now I'm running out of time. <laughs> it's what we're doing here. Yeah. We all, and this is something, a realization I had to come through, a heartbreaking realization. We all can't change the world. Yeah. I can't be foster mom, an excellent teacher, an excellent mentor, an excellent mom to my own children and partner to my husband who's here tonight. Mm -hmm. But I can know my why and I can work on that. Absolutely. So I love microscopes. I love science. I love the brain. How do I take what I love and answer that why? Mm -hmm. And so we find what our why is. We see where the question is that needs to be answered. Mm -hmm. We bridge that. And for example, Starvis Nyakos does, does this. Yeah. But we can speak to teachers, but what mm -hmm. we do, they don't have to come into the lab where we spend hours and years in basements. Mm -hmm. And we can bring it to light to the students of the next generation. And they can go into college and they can find their why and they can bridge these gaps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's doing exactly what we're doing right now. I think those are such beautiful responses, and I want to thank you all for being so thoughtful with your research um, and for sharing your expertise with the audience. I think we can all say that we learned so much from these research talks. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for being here today and for listening and being so engaged. And for all you lovely folks on Zoom, thank you as well for being here in spirit and for asking your questions. Um, I would like folks to take two minutes to at least fill out the survey that we'll place in the chat and let us know what you thought about today's event. We appreciate any feedback. So um, without further ado, please give it up for our wonderful lady. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Thank you. I have 15 seconds of closing remarks. So <laughs> sorry. I know I'm not, I'm not the most exciting part of this, <laughs> but I just want to echo the thanks to our wonderful speakers and moderator, to Dr. Marlin, Dr. Hurd, Dr. Greenwood for this really deep and, and really much needed conversation. So thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And thank you all to all of you who submitted questions. You know, we can't get to all of them, but I saw a lot of great research questions in the in the submissions. So keep those ideas going. Yes. You know, we really need that that just those 
ideas. I already said it. I'm not as eloquent because you're here to see these speakers. But <laughs> if you enjoyed tonight's program, I really hope you will join us soon in February, Thursday, February 9th. We have our next Stavros Narcos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture. And it'll be all about the neuroscience of vision and what it means for technology and computer vision. We'll have Dr. Rudy Benia and Dr. Shiran Song as our speakers, as well as Dr. Vasuhi Chauhan, who will be our moderator. So keep an eye out for that announcement. And thank you all for tuning in and all these different modalities. And please stay healthy and have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you.